So every year when I come here, I always get this email from Mary Sukhava. Can you speak on this subject? And I say, of course. <laughs> and so she has chosen the subject, and I'm not to blame. <laughs> well, at least, not directly, anyway. <laughs> so, anyway, it's, uh, it is a very, what we say, important principle in our devotional life, and it's the foundation for us to be able to move forward when things are stuck. And the topic is forgiveness, which is very, very essential principle in order to practice Krishna consciousness successfully. So this verse is chosen from the ninth canto, chapter 15, verse number 40. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 Samaya Rochitam Lakshmi Purport. 
Different personalities become beautiful by possessing different qualities. Chanaka Pandit says that the cuckoo bird, although very black, is beautiful because of its sweet voice. Similarly, a woman becomes beautiful by her chastity and faithfulness to her husband, and an ugly person becomes beautiful when he becomes a learned scholar. In the same way, Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Sudras become beautiful by their qualities. Brahmanas are beautiful when they are forgiving, Kshatriyas when they are heroic, heroic and never retreat from fighting, Vaishyas when they enrich cultural activities and protect cows, and Sudras when they are faithful and discharge of duties pleasing to their masters. Thus, everyone becomes beautiful by special qualities. And the special quality of a Brahman is described here as forgiveness. <clears throat> Om Ajnan Timirandasya Gena Jana Salakaya Chaksuya Vitam Neha Tasmai Shri Gurve Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nityanane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nere Sesha Sunyavadi Pasyata Devasatarine Shri Krishna Chaitanya Guru Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasari Mora Bhakta Vrita Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 So here we, <clears throat> we see that there are certain outstanding qualities that apply to certain personalities when they exhibit these qualities, they become very attractive, very beautiful. Just to others and to themselves and also in their execution of devotional service. So here what is being focused on is um, the Brahminical quality of forgiveness. Now, sometimes people may re misinterpret this uh, purport by saying, well, only the Brahmanas have to be forgiven. <laughs> because it says here, a Kshatriya becomes beautiful by heroic duties, Vaishyas by, you know, by protecting cows, and Sudras by performing service to others in, in a pleasing way. But this applies to all those who engage in devotional service. <coughs> And so forgiveness is actually one of the, what we say, ornaments of a Vaishnava. <clears throat> because actually a Vaishnava is above the Brahman. The Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudras, and the different ashramas are simply within the Vaishnava ashram system and they are considered to be material. But Vaishnava is spiritual. Therefore, the quality of forgiveness enhances the quality of spirituality in the, in the life and the execution of one who is a Vaishnava. So forgiveness is a very, what we say, complex issue. And how one practices that and how one deals with it is very much, uh, what we say, relevant to the situation at hand. But we have examples in the Shastras and some really powerful examples how and Daksha, he was very, very, what we say, offensive to his son-in-law, Lord Shiva, who was a very powerful controller. Lord Shiva's Mahadev, and he is, he's practically on the level of Lord Vishnu. So Daksha was very much blessed by being connected with such a person through his family relationship, but he couldn't appreciate that. He was thinking he was actually superior to Lord Shiva. Why? Because Shiva was his son-in-law and therefore the father-in-law thinks, the father-in-law thinks that the son-in-law is inferior. This is ordinary parlance, people think like that. He's my son-in-law, therefore I'm his father-in-law. So there's this kind of this mentality of being in a better position. So that was the thinking of uh, Daksha. <coughs> Now, we know the story how he offended Lord Shiva, but Lord Shiva forgave him. But still, he had to suffer afterwards. 
So you might think, well, Lord Shiva was forgiving, why did he have to suffer? Because Lord Shiva didn't give him his favor. That in the process of forgiveness, favor also has to come. So one may be forgiving but not favorable to the offender. And Shiva was not favorable because he knew the mentality of Daksha. And therefore, because of that, Daksha, in his next life, took birth in a lower and he was, he was born in a Kshatriya family, and he also again committed offense to Manarada Muni, which was due to the residue of his offensive mentality that he still had from his previous life, and therefore he went down even farther. So the, the element of point here is that, that if one is, uh, for, forgives an offender, or one is forg forgives an offender, still they have to get the favor. Because if they don't get the favor of the person, then the Supreme Personality of God it doesn't take that offense very lightly. So it says that one may be forgiven, but at the same time, Krishna has to be happy. In other words, that person has to favor you. In other words, everything has to be clean. Otherwise, that residue of that offense continues. So that was the, the effects of Shiva. Now we have the example of complete forgiveness where, I mean Ravana, he had offended Ram by stealing Sita, and Ram gave him so many chances. <clears throat> he said, all you have to do is give back Sita and you can live in your kingdom, and I won't really try to destroy you. But Ravana was obstinate, lusty, couldn't understand the position of Ram, and he was overwhelmed by his own material lusty desires. And so in order to help him get relieved of that, the Lord had to kill him. So that was his retribution, and he became purified by that killing. Now, the Lord told Bibishan, which was Ravana's younger brother, who now had become a devotee of the Lord, had given up his allegiance to his brother. And the Lord wanted to honor Ravana in the sense that he wanted to honor his soul. So he told him, you perform the last rites for your departed brother. And Vibhishan was reluctant to do that because he knew how sinful his brother was and how offensive he was. But the Lord said, no, actually he is now purified and we are not seeing him as the body of Ravana anymore. We are seeing him as the soul. So for the soul, the soul is always purified in all stages of life. And therefore Ram was seeing it in that way. And then Vibhishan went ahead. And therefore the Lord was showing that actually now there was no residue of any offense and therefore he should be honored in his death. And of course, he got a glorious death, getting killed by the Supreme Personality of God. Sometimes devotees think, hmm, maybe I should try that. But it doesn't work if you plan it. <laughs> if you don't plan it, maybe something may happen, but that's also quite remote. But here, we, we see that situation. We have another example in the Shastras, which is even, even more outstanding is Vidura and Dhritarashtra. Uh, Vidura was the moral and moral guide for basically the Pandava family and also the Kuru family. And so he would always give moral instruction, seeing that his elder brother Dhritarashtra, although he was the king, was on this uh, adventure to destroy the Pandavas, he tried to explain to him that, you know, these Pandavas are innocent, they are their rightful kingdom. And therefore, you shouldn't favor your rascal son, Diyodhana. But, he couldn't hear. It says that he was blind in two ways, physically and spiritually. He wasn't able to hear good instructions. And therefore, they say if you give good instructions to a, a person who is somewhat envious or angry, they become more of the same. And that's what happened. So rather than appreciating the good instructions of Vidura, he banned him from the kingdom. And Vidura left. 
And after some time, he came to his senses and he actually forgave Vidor and called him back. And Vidor realized that he was very heavenly offended by his brother, but he didn't take offense. He simply understood this is the nature of this person. Therefore, I forgive him. But one thing he didn't do, he didn't trust him. So this is an, also an element that works in relationship to forgiveness. Forgive but don't trust. Because trust may also open up the door to further discretions, further offenses. So in the case of Vidura, Vidura used that lack of trust so he could monitor his brother's activities and continue to give him more instructions. And therefore he kept the door open where he could actually reform, which he did. So he was the well-wisher of his brother. But by not allowing that trust to manifest, it, it allowed Vidura to ha keep the position of being the instructor and at the same time be careful not to become offended again. This is an interesting point. We use it, we use it as a cliche, forgive but don't trust. Now, does trust ever really manifest again? Only when the person who has caused the offense is actually seen to be completely repentant and reformed in activities. That doesn't usually happen at the beginning. But when that does, after some time, then trust may re again. So forgiven, forgiveness is not for the person who is offended. It's for the one, I mean for the person who is the offender, it's for the person who is offended. One who becomes offended or feels offended, if they hold this grudge or this attitude of lack of forgiveness towards that person, then they suffer more than the person. I was giving a lecture in Bhaktivedanta Manor, and it was about five or six years ago. And the topic was on Vaishnav relationships. So right after the class, I mean, there was questions, but this lady wanted to speak privately, so she came up to me. In a very, kind of like, she was somewhat unhappy, and disturbed, maybe something I said. So she came up to me and she said, you know, Maharaj, you're talking about forgiveness, but I can't do it. I can't do it. I have this problem with this one person who offended me and I just can't forgive her. I said, well, how long ago was that? She said, 25 years. Oh. I, almost, I almost fell off my chair. <laughs> how is it possible to hold that kind of negativity for such a long period of time? Well, what can I do to, to somehow relieve her of her anxiety? I said, you have to practice that because actually there's statistics. There's one man called Fred Ruskin. He wrote one book and that was about forgiveness. And he documented that those who don't practice forgiveness, they are more tendency to ill health. It actually destroys one's health if it's kept in a long period of time. So in this case, um, this idea of letting go is actually beneficial for one's own, what we say, peace of mind. But sometimes it becomes difficult because we think either we have to get back at the person or do something or pray that Krishna smashes them. <laughs> have you ever prayed like that? No, don't pray like that. <laughs> but that could also be in some form of thought that one may also, you know, decide to entertain, which just, just causes more and more negativity. But the general principle is to learn how to forgive, but at the same time, don't always immediately give that trust there. And then another way to see when some discretion or some offense comes your way, what did I do to deserve this? This is the karmic aspect of this is there something about me that has caused Krishna or the material energy to act in such a way that this person is giving me a reaction for my activity? And generally, generally this is more or less the case. 
we find sometimes we see that when you do something to someone, you know, sometimes you notice just right after that, or maybe a little later, some the same thing happens to you. And you think, oh yeah, but now I understand why it happened. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's not so immediate, but it does happen like that. So a lot of times we can see, and as Prabhupada used this, he said, don't be disturbed by the interest, instrument of your karma. So a lot of times, it's hard to really judge. You have to judge each of the situations according to time, place, person, circumstance, and, and so many ingredients that made up the activity. But a lot of times, it's just we're learning a lesson or getting a reaction that helps us learn the lessons. Reactions are some ways to learn lessons in our spiritual life or learn lessons on how to take more shelter from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And that's one of the ways to deal with situations like that. When somehow one feels offended, immediately there is this, the mind goes to different levels of what we know. They're wrong, I'm cheated, you know, so many things. And is that the way to somehow say, why is Krishna allowing this to happen to me, or why is Krishna making this happen to me? He allows it, or he maybe wants it. He has two aspects of his nature. For some reason he may allow it, and other reasons, when it's more direct and severe, he may want it to happen for some punishment. You see the example of Ambarish Maharaj and Durvasa Muni. I mean, Ambarish Maharaj was a saintly king. He didn't commit any offense at all. He simply apparently made a discretion in the, in the execution of some ritual. But Durvasa Muni was envious. He was envious of the king and so he looked for some fault. And looking for some fault, he decided to, to uh, take some action. The action was so severe that he actually wanted to kill Ambarish Maharaj. And of course, Ambarish Maharaj immediately took shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead with complete faith and devotion. And Krishna Shudarshan Chakra was immediately present in the life of Ambarish, I mean, in uh, Durvasa Muni. Durvasa Muni had to go everywhere in order to get away from that chakra. He went to Lord Brahma's abode. Brahma said, Vishnu's chakra. He went to Shiva. Shiva, he's an expansion of Lord Shiva. Shiva said, you blew it. <laughs> so many ways, you know, he wasn't able to. Finally, he went to Lord Vishnu. And Lord Vishnu said, um, actually, I can't do anything either. I'm, I'm, I'm helpless. I'm tied by the love of my devotee. My devotee's love keeps me under their control. And therefore, because you have offended my devotee, I can't do anything. Only my devotee can relieve you of that offense. He got a wake-up call, took shelter of the lotus feet of, uh, of Ambarish Maharaj. Of course, Ambarish Maharaj didn't even consider that, it, that uh, he had been, that he had been offended. He was so humble. And sometimes we might also think like that. If someone commits some discretion or acts in a bad way or causes us, we might think, well, if I was in that situation, because sometimes we use this as a therapy, when people who have this have become offended and they can't get rid of it, what would you have done if you were in another person's position in relationship to the situation? You might also think like that. And sometimes we think, oh yes, maybe I would have reacted the rape the same in the same way. And so, therefore, that helps to diffuse a little bit of the hurt that comes by way of... So there's different ways to... But ultimately, as it says here, it's an ornament of a Vaishnava, of forgiveness. And we find that this is so, what we say, fundamental to living, because 
every day, not every day, but it seems like it's quite happened, something does something to someone to disturb you. Sometimes you expect someone to be friendly to you and you get the opposite. <laughs> or you're friendly to someone else and they don't respond at all. In other words, we always find that in interpersonal relationships, there's sometimes there's something lacking to make it what we say pleasant, pleasing, communicable, something. So, therefore, of course, tolerance is the principle that allows forgiveness to manifest. But forgiveness is the essential uh, quality of a devotee. And we find there was a story, I don't know all the details, but I had heard this story that the Amish community up in Pennsylvania, one crazy man came into the Amish community with a gun and started shooting up the whole community. This happened about 10 years ago, maybe you heard this, yeah. And of course, so many people were killed, the man was arrested. And then the authorities came to the Amish, and they, the Amish said, we forgive him. We understand that he is just sick, and therefore, a sick man, is, he's just, we don't want to see him punished. They actually forgave him. Now this is pretty much amazing when you think about it. He actually killed many of their members. So we can see extreme examples how when people are actually very close to God and understand that they're in that relationship with God, that there's nothing that anybody can do to me that hurt my relationship with God. And therefore, if I'm forgiving, then this is the nature. And also, there's one other principle that I like to think. What have I done <coughs> that has caused me to be, what we say, slighted again. Of course, that's the karmic thing. And that way, one doesn't take these things. But in one, one way, is to stop suffering by holding this negativity towards others. It's your own suffering. We either clam up or we blow up, right? <laughs> if we clam up, then that energy goes internally and it destroys our our peace of mind and also our health. If we blow up, then we somehow or other can cause more damage. So, um, the formula, there's three options, forgive and forget. That's not the main one. There's one is forgive but don't forget. Or forgive and don't trust. And the third one is to redress the issue with the person involved and try to somehow or other sort it out through communications. These are three, three options that we more or less have. There may be more that I haven't <coughs> considered, but these are the three main ones. Personally, I like the one forgive but don't forget because we don't want to get hurt again. But forgiveness is, is, is for the one who has been hurt. So we're running close to the end of class. Any questions, comments on this principle of forgiveness? Yes, Mother Sukhama. Thank you for choosing the topic. One comment, comment and one question about the Amish community. There's actually a book written on it. I think it's called Amazing Grace. He didn't just come into the community. He went into the school and killed a bunch of children. What school, you know? Yeah, and so the parents forgave him. So that was... Maybe a little bit more intense. Mm. And then uh, the question is, so, you know, a devotee like Amarish Maharaj, he forgave Dravas, meaning, you know, he didn't consider an offense, but if a person isn't even admitting a mistake or even asking for forgiveness, and they be thinking that, you know, I'll just chant and that offense will just get dissipated by Krishna, does that story hold true that Krishna won't, won't, won't necessarily let that go until you kind of realize you made a mistake, something like that? Well, there's, there's the statement by Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which is mentioned in Ancha Lila. For those who blaspheme and offend devotees, it's like drinking poisoning. 
and those who glorify the devotees is like drinking nectar. Those who repeatedly offend devotees, he says that my holy name destroys them. Even if they're chanting the holy name, that holy name destroys them. <clears throat> That's a statement by Mahaprabhu. So we have to be very, what we say, how Krishna sees it generally, if one is sincerely trying to overcome whatever offense that they, but if they don't recognize that they actually commit an offense or need to be in a position of asking forgiveness, they may go on. Therefore, the person who is offended shouldn't trust that person. And sometimes we distance ourselves in order not to get hurt again. That's the main thing, because by getting hurt again, or allowing that thing to repeat, that person who does it commits another offense. And so it's bad for them also. So does that help? I, I can't see you anymore. Okay, oh, okay yeah. Yes, Prabhu. Varaha Prabhu. Varaha. Uh, Maras, since you went down this road, if you could speak just a little something about Vaishnava Aparad, because that's really the, the heavy, the heavy. Vaishnava Aparad? Bhakti Thakur explains in one, I'm not exactly sure what scripture is written, but he says there's six ways to offend a Vaishnava, and he starts from the most severe way. The first way is to kill a Vaishnava. That's the most severe. Second is to blaspheme a Vaishnava. What is blaspheme? Blasphemy means you have many good qualities, but there's some discretion or some flaw that I'm looking for. I find that flaw, and I broadcast that as your personality. And that's what Daksha did to Shiva. <laughs> yeah. uh, down from that, less offense is to be envious of a Vaishnava. Less than that is to become angry of a at a Vaishnava. The next one down is not to give respects to a Vaishnava. And the last one is not to feel happy when you see a Vaishnava. So, what do you do with that one? <laughs> That's the least severe, but the, the antidote for that lack of men, proper mentality is to offer your obeisances. If you're not feeling happy, just offer your obeisances and then there's no offense. So that's Bhakti Vinodha. Each one requires some, you know, further explanations, but that's the general nice thing, yeah. Yes, uh two leader Prabhu. Uh oh. <laughs> I got my garland. <laughs> In the course of living, it seems that there's always something that we do that offends others. So unconsciously. Really? Unconsciously, a lot of times. Okay. Uh, so, we have this philosophy that if we chant the holy names of the Lord, we'll be relieved from more sins than we could commit even in many, many lifetimes. So sometimes we take shelter of that, that, okay, we're committing so many mistakes, uh, even offenses, setting others not, then we just could go along with our sadhana and say Hare Krishna. No, no, because we'll never be able to figure out and calculate all the mistakes that we made. No, because if you're actually life. chanting the holy names of the Lord, you won't continue to make the same offenses. You should be able to rectify that mentality that caused that these offenses. And the holy name is is the most powerful antidote for you know, purifying our consciousness. If we're actually chanting, if we're chanting with a fence, then it won't work, it won't have the same effect. So a devotee should pray that, please forgive me if I've committed any offenses knowingly or unknowingly. They can offer prayers like that. But just like I was remembering one story by one very senior Vaishnavi in our society. She was chanting and she, she told the story in public as a class. She said, my chanting was really off. I couldn't chant, I couldn't chant. 
But then I must, I was thinking, I must have offended somebody, and this is the reason why I can't chant. So she started praying. And then, and by after the prayer, the next day she got a phone call from one of her friends and said, this lady, you know, she really offended her son, and she's really angry at you. So after that prayer, it became clear where the offense was committed. So that was Krishna's arrangement. And then, of course, she apologized to the person. So there are different ways to, what we say, approach the wrong mentality through prayer, through chanting. And then the ultimate, of course, is that there's a place in Navadvip Dham called Koladvip. It's the ashram of Devananda Pandit, who had offended Sri Vastakura. And of course, he, he was forgiven, even by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And later, um, his ashram was designated as a place that if anyone commits any offense to Vaishnavas, you could go there, and pray, chant, and get relief from the reactions. So, of course, that's not a, you know, a way to continue the same mentality. It's just for those who sincerely want to get free from the reactions. Thank you, okay. Yes, Prabhu. Well, John, you mentioned now that uh, you can forgive, but uh, sometimes not trust. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, my question arises out of a particular incident that I heard, and maybe some devotees can confirm this. There was a certain devotee who actually took Lakshmi from the temple, and he was actually caught pretty much with all the evidence, and they were going to turn him over to the police. And when Srila Prabhupada heard that, Prabhupada said, no, forgive him, don't call the police. And it happened more than once. That means he was trusted again and forgiven again. So I'm assuming that uh, the higher the realization of a Vaishnava, yes, one can be forgiving and also one can be trusting. So can you kind of you can reconcile? Yeah, I mentioned that, that trust is again reinstated when a person has been shown to have changed in their ways. But if they if they haven't indicated that by their behavior, then then you be might, might be a little cautious to give that person the same facility where they can again. Yeah. But simply by forgiving a person doesn't mean that their tendency to do the same thing stops. Mm -hmm. Or even punishing a person doesn't necessarily mean. There has to be a change of heart. So Prabhupada didn't really want us to get involved with the, so the secular society and make a big thing out of it. He wanted us to deal with it internally, which was the, the wise thing to do. Catching all the words. Right now, there's a big uproar in society, not only in the Catholic Church, but even here. Um, there's uproar about <coughs> um, you know, child abuse. Child abuse. Mm, yeah. Um, Very they, they they it internally. Um, so I'm just wondering how do you reconcile justice? <coughs> That's justice. The offender should be punished, yeah. You can't, for forgiveness doesn't, what we say, negate justice. No. 
Because then, you know, then where do we stand? Then there's no rules and regulations. Justice has to be there for the offender. There has to be some reaction. So in that case, using the example of child molestation, there is legal punishment that comes with that. And that's right. Mm -hmm. Even though the person whose child may have been offended may forgive the person, still the justice should be there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Otherwise, others will take advantage of that and then it'll go on. I think we have an example. I think when Yeah, when Maharaj Pariksit saw the personality of Vul being beaten, beaten by a low-class man, he was about to kill him. But then before he killed him, he asked the bull why. And the bull gave different reasons why he was suffering. Of course, that we're going a little bit away from your point, but the bull actually answered that one who actually blames the perpetrator of a, a wrong act also becomes implicated in the same reaction. And so, but Maharaj Pariksha did something, he banished, you know, Kali from, you know, the kingdom and told him he couldn't stay anywhere. And finally, he gave him one place where there was hoarding of gold. But he gave him, he got a reaction, he, had to, he couldn't stay anywhere in the kingdom. So justice has to be there when there is these offenses like that. Actually, Prabhupada said, it was actually Vishnu John Maharaj was talking about New Vrindavan. He said, in, in New Vrindavan, they have a justice system where if someone commits some you know, discretion or breaks some rules of the community or commits some offense, they go before a board of elders and ten. Prabhupada said, very good system. Very good system. You can hear it on the tape, it was Vishnu John Maharaj. And so, I, I think we had that many years ago. So then this board of elders, which are dealing with the situation in a compassionate, but also in a Shastric way, is a very good way to, uh, to secure people's faith in living in a community. And also for those who do something wrong, and they know they're going to do something, going to be some reaction is going to come outside of the person who they offended. It's a good system. Prabhupada liked it. Yes, Madri. Let me know if I'm going over time here. We have about five minutes left. He said that he's not. We do not uh, trust the person because we don't want to be hurt again. Right? But then it seems to me there's another level where we don't need to be hurt. There's this famous quote by Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj that when faults in others dilute you, you introspect, look within, because no one can harm you unless you oh, harm yourself. So you you want to go on that level? Okay. <laughs> that's pretty. <laughs> yeah, that's Vaishnava. <laughs> that's the way we should be thinking. You hit, I mean, you, you gave us the ultimate principle. <laughs> Where can we go from there? You know, one can hurt you unless you allow that. You have to look within yourself and see what is about you that's causing you to be hurt by that other person's activity. Here's a question. <clears throat> Not everyone can follow that one. <laughs> so, I um, was at home watching your class on my board uh, TV and it started storming, and the power went out. So, um, I left off maybe 25 minutes ago. So, <laughs> if, uh, <clears throat> Welcome. Since the uh, class is about forgiveness, you'll have to forgive me if I ask you something that you already covered. 
<laughs> I, I give you that forgiveness ahead of time. <laughs> I was thinking uh, in the uh, in our ISKCON history, we know that uh, a lot of the people that have been uh, appointed as gurus have had their difficulties, and so the disciples, uh, their lives have been disturbed in certain ways. So. Is there such a thing as forgiving the guru for uh, deviating from the path? Or does the disciple think, well, it's due to my offenses, it's due to my uh, not following properly, that he couldn't bear the, the burden of my, my sin? Interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you take the second part, that it was, was due to me that he fell down, then it's all over. There's no problem with you anymore. So you, you've solved the whole mental anxiety that may have caused the, you to feel something different. But if it's, you know, if other people are feeling the same way, when someone in that position does, and if it's obvious, it's maybe more than just that. But that's a very humble, and I say also, maybe in one sense, correct. Sometimes gurus or people in the position of gurus take on, out of concern and compassion for others, they take on a little bit too much. And therefore, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu writes, in, or it's quoted in Bhagavatam, that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said that one should not take on too many disciples. So then the question comes, well, what is too many? But that's not answered. That means more than one can actually make sure that they get whatever they need in, in order to make progress in the path of devotional service. But then there's that mood of compassion that, you know, we want to give everyone a chance. So there's always this dichotomy between compassion and you know, where do I break, you know, stop? Mm -hmm. Finally, is there anything, is there such a thing as the body forgiving Krishna? Krishna is suffering so horribly, you know, <laughs> don't understand why I don't deserve this. Well, there's a statement by Krishna, he said, you know, this material world is a miserable place and, and you're suffering, you know why? At least because I set it up like that. He makes that statement about the Vinod Thakur, says that. Krishna says, this place is miserable, it's my fault. I arranged it. Why? Because I love you, I don't want you to stay here. <laughs> That's the reason. So, forgiving Krishna, I, Krishna is spotless, there's no blemish on him. But sometimes he looks like he does something that requires us to forgive him. But that's only from our limited perspective. I mean, he broke his promise. He came charging after Bhishma Dev when he said he wasn't going to fight. So sometimes people say, well, it's better to worship Ram. Whatever he says, he does. But Krishna, his cane is crooked. You know, you never know what Krishna might do. And that's why he's called Hari. He just takes everything away. But still, it's perfect. <laughs> but from our limited vision, it looks some, like something like unfair. Krishna's perfect. Okay, thank you. I don't want to break. I know we have a very rigid schedule. So thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam ki Jai. Srimad Bhagavatam ki Jai. Solidarity of Ramani Maharaj ki Jai.